I do honestly believe that once we change our diet and allow our gut microbiome to flourish to the best of our abilities and stop putting inflammatory foods in, that's when this awareness especially for me, and I'm just speaking through my own experience, that's when I started to really go with the flow and really try to tap in, or not even really try to tap in, but just be aware that we are completely in control and accountable for our lives. Every single decision that we make, we have to be, we have to own. You know, me coming here today to be in LA and to connect with you and to have a swim and then come here and have the injection in my arm uh, or the intravenous drip into my arm. You know, that was a choice that I made and I own that and I will own the rest of the choices about what I eat today and what I'm drinking and, and all of this. And I was in the... F- <laughs> All right, we're back with Dr. Gary. We got a good one today. So fired up, we had Chef Pete Evans come to town, Australian celebrity, chef, TV, personality, filmmaker, Gary. Were you stoked or what? (laughs) This was one of the most exciting podcasts I have. I mean, I can't even believe this happened, guys. Uh, Pete made his movie, The Magic Pill. It was a huge inspiration for me. It was a big reason why I sort of changed my perspective. And the fact that he, uh, he, I mean, look, he came to the clinic. He spent most of the day with me and Brian. We got to know him. We shared stories. He, uh, he had some IV therapy with us. He told us some amazing stories. We shared our life stories. We recorded a lot of it. And man, Brian, how lucky are we to get to know this guy? And uh, I'm really excited for everyone to hear our conversation. Yeah. Well, I wish they could hear the whole day. I mean, right? he's, he's kind of a special guy. It's hard yeah. to explain. Like, you know, just like when you just bond with someone and you, you can be open up emotionally and yeah. he's such a positive person. And I kind of changed the way I thought and I've had more of a positive outlook and or just positive intentions on what I do since I talked to him. It was such a reminder of like why we're doing what we're doing. And he comes to it from, I think, such a different perspective being a chef, um, you know, in a different part of his life than us. And still it felt like felt like we know the guy we yeah there were so many conversations and stories we told that was off camera that i wish we could share uh, and you know maybe we'll reconnect with him and really get to dive into some of those heavier topics but yeah. i think we really got into it on this podcast um uh some of you will notice like brian was started the podcast because i was actively in my medical clinic seeing patients that day and then finally i was able to peel off and join them and man, what a treat was was that day. Yeah. Yeah. We we even ate lunch the next day. I met him in Venice and we ate lunch and just just great stuff. Let's just get to it, you know? Let's let's get yeah. to it. He he really supports Sapien and what we're doing. And he's he had Dr. Gary on his podcast and he's gonna have Christy yeah. on his podcast too. And just big supporter of what we're doing. And and yeah, just go yeah. to sapien.org and learn more. Absolutely. Sapien.org is going to get you guys everything you need to know about us. Uh, and honestly, if you have it and you'll hear it again, check out his movie, The Magic Pill, because it's it's really a, a special movie uh, for me. And I know a lot of people in this community. Yeah. And we're going to make Food Lies, make it great. It's it's a, oh, We're man. making a Game Changers debunked film because it's getting really confusing. I, we don't want to be super anti-vegan, but it's getting really confusing when these vegan propaganda films are coming out and it's yeah. everyone doesn't know what to think. So that's coming out November 27th. You can go to the food lies YouTube and subscribe there and you'll see that. And yeah, come into the clinic. If you're in LA, go to saving.org, check out our programs. If you want to talk to Dr. Gary, do some consulting with weight loss programs, disease reversal. We got all kinds of stuff going on. We got nose to tail meets, nose to tail.org. I don't want to go into all this stuff. No, I, let me just give you a little plug, but I got my nose to tail box uh, just a few days ago and oh my God, we got the beef bacon, amazing stuff. <laughs> I didn't even know beef, you could have bacon, but I mean, it's really, wow, every morning. It's the best uh, of both worlds. You got beef and you got bacon. Fat, yeah. 
<laughs> oh my god, beef bacon. Um, I made uh like slow cooked ribs, uh, the short ribs. It was amazing, and I have an entire freezer full of this stuff. So All I'm right. a huge fan, Brian. I love it. I love it as well. And let's get on to the <laughs> show, Pete Evans, my man. All right. All right. We're going live. We got Pete Evans here at Evolve Healthcare. Thanks for coming in, Pete. <laughs> Pleasure, mate. So this is live? This is, oh, not live, but li- <laughs> recording live in person. We are alive. We are in person. Pete flew in from Australia a few hours ago. I did. A uh, nice long flight. I think it's 14 hours or so. And uh, straight off the plane into the ocean down at Venice Beach, a little dip in the morning, and then uh, you picked us up, and here we are at Evolve Health Clinic. Is that correct? Healthcare, whatever we call it. That, yeah, it's so awesome. You, you made it into the ocean straight off the plane, and yeah, we dr- drove up the Malibu coast. The water was warm, actually. I was su- actually surprised. I thought it was going to be a lot colder, but uh, I just went in my underwear. <laughs> ah, well, Australia has cold water. I went there, and it's freezing. Parts of it can be very, very cold. and um, But yeah, I was grateful for, for that and uh, just spent the last two hours having a, um, a Myers cocktail or performance cocktail intravenous and then also some glutathione, glutathione. which um, Dr. Gary uh, Schiffler and yourself suggested that would be a good thing for me yeah. to help with the jet lag. I hope it is. I hope it is. It takes a second to settle in, but yeah, it's always good to get rehydrated. And I didn't faint, which is a good thing. Uh, So there's so many things. I feel like we already did a podcast for the last three hours. We've been having some amazing talks. There's so much to get into with you. I everyone should know about the magic pill. You probably already saw it on Netflix. That's Pete's movie. He uh, he's an amazing guy. So it's just so cool uh, getting to know you just over the internet. You know, I listened to your podcast. You came on my podcast. I went on your podcast. And there's a million topics to get into. You're already already on my Peak Human podcast, so people can go back and listen to that one. But there's so much more to you that I'm discovering. Well, there's there's a lot to everybody, and I think that's probably one of the interesting things, especially about our society these days, is we, we tend to identify with certain labels or certain job descriptions. And even our identities, we seem to identify ourselves um, based on so many of these different factors, you know, and we nearly end up trying to fit in these boxes either to feel safe, to protect ourselves or to please others. Mm. And one thing that I like to do is just be myself. And I, I think I explained it somewhere the other day. Someone put an expectation on me because I shared something on social media and they said, I wish you would just stick to cooking. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I was like, well, you know, I, I, I said, I can't even define myself at the moment. So if, if I'm undefinable undef- in my own, um, I guess, language or understanding of my own self, you know, I'm still working it out. Mm-hmm. How could anybody else try to define who I am mm-hmm. and what gives me the right to be able to judge anybody else? Because what we see of anybody is generally our own perception of that person anyway. And, you know, as you said, you don't, you don't know me mm-hmm. completely. Mm-hmm. I don't even know myself completely. I'm about to go and do a week of psychedelic um, uh, journeys or therapies and take ayahuasca, and I'll be doing that three or four times next week. And part of that is for me to, to rediscover parts of myself that I might have pushed to be dormant or suppressed or actually pull off some layers of my identity to find a new clarity and potentially even put on another layer of my identity, you know, if that makes sense. So it's not always about pulling off. It could be actually putting on. So um, I, one of my greatest ways to describe it is we're all just a work in progress. Mm-hmm. You know? That's so cool. So... Everything you say is or, like, or maybe not work in progress, under construction. Under construction. <laughs> but I, we, we've talked about so many things already today, and, and it's like everything is so profound. It seems like you seem like this enlightened person. Where, <laughs> but you're not. You're not searching for it. You said this earlier that you're not. You don't seek it. It comes to you in a way. 
Yeah, I think over the years I've become more and more in tune with my intuition and going with the gut. Mm -hmm. And I think the first part of that journey is actually making sure that our guts work properly. Mm. You know, from all the research that I've done about diet and nutrition and our microbiome. And I, I think, you know, I, I had an interview with Kieran Krishnan the other day who works at Microbiome Labs, if that's correct. And apologies if that's not mm. exactly how I pronounce mm. how his name is pronounced and exactly not his job title or where he works. But he's one of the leading experts in the leading experts globally about the microbiome. And even he said, he goes, we know so little about it. You talk to a neurologist or, or anyone that works on the brain and they say the same thing. We know so little about these systems of our body or these uh, parts of our body uh, or these organs. And even that in itself, when you have experts that de devote their lives to studying either the gut or the brain and they, and they openly admit and humbly admit that they know so little, and then we, if we translate that into, well, how do we know ourselves completely? And sometimes it is through these psychedelic or entheogenic or plant medicine journeys that we get to have a glimpse of who we are in our entirety. And part of those journeys, I believe, is for us to realize the wholeness or re-remember re who we were when we came into this existence. And for us then to be able to draw on that experience that we have to bring into our waking life. And that can be difficult for us as well, because as soon as we're back into this experience, we have our masks and our egos and our protective layers on. And sometimes we forget about that profound experience we might have had then. Or if somebody's having a near-death experience, you know, that could be the catalyst for them to look at themselves and the world they inhabit through a different lens. But to go back to following your intuition, I do honestly believe that once we change our diet and allow our gut microbiome to flourish to the best of our abilities and stop putting inflammatory foods in, that's when this awareness, especially for me, and I'm just speaking through my own experience, that's when I started to really go with the flow and really try to tap in, or not even really try to tap in, but just be aware that we are completely in control and accountable for our lives. Every single decision that we make, we have to be, we have to own. You know, me coming here today to be in LA and to connect with you and to have a swim and then come here and have the injection in my arm uh, or the intravenous drip into my arm. You know, that was a choice that I made and I own that. And I will own the rest of the choices about what I eat today and what I'm drinking and, and all of this. And I was in the flow when these opportunities came. The opportunity to come to LA and come to Costa Rica next week or go to Costa Rica, I should say, and, and go into this ayahuasca journey. And it felt right for me. And it, it's no really way I can explain it other than I feel when something enters or I create an idea, if it feels right and there's no hesitation there, then I feel like it's the right path. And when there is that hesitation, it's like, hmm, hmm, there's something in here. Well, that's the intuition. It's It sounds like you're talking about the gut, right? People talk about the gut, the intuition. It's like a real thing. It yeah. sounds like woo woo, but it's like, no, that's a real. Yeah. And when we put in the foods that can block and that's, or, or to, I guess if there is a communication, which mm. I believe there is between our gut and our brain or our conscious mind, um, when we're ingesting foods or beverages or in relationships that can break that connection, and very simple, I mean, the, the classic one is consuming uh, foods with additives, you know, with anything with those numbers in it, you know, or those preservatives, that can cause an inflammatory response where our nearly our intention has to go on healing that area so it takes us out of our flow. This is just, again, my perception. Or if we're eating gluten or too many refined carbohydrates, you know, it throws our blood sugar balance out. So all of a sudden we are no longer in the flow, so to speak, of our intuition because our body is trying to heal itself 
So it's putting its energy into that. Let's fix this shit up. What's going on in here? Because you've put some stuff in there that we don't like. So we sort of take our attention away from what is present. Or maybe not as what is present, but to our intuition about what's, what the future may hold. That's so interesting because in many cases, we see, I work mostly on, with people on diet. And then they, when they change their diet, it changes their life. Mm-hmm. And we were talking earlier about it. It's not just one thing. It's like a holistic thing. It, it's, there's so many pieces to it. But why? it seems like the diet is one of the most powerful ones to start with because you can take control. Like just to say we had a woman, Adele, who's going to be in the film and she changed her diet and it changed her life. And so it went beyond it's is how do how do you think those stepping stones go or like can you start anywhere? Yeah, I think it could be different for everybody, you know. Um one of the things that I always say is food's generally the easiest. But in saying that, if you have an emotional eating pattern based around food, then just thinking you're gonna change your diet will probably lead you into a merry-go-round that may not produce the results you're after. Because if you're not underlying that core belief pattern, so for instance, really simply, some people associate eating certain foods with, I guess we showed it, we illustrated it in the magic pill. We had a lady with her grandchild and this lady said she was an emotional eater. So when she was growing up as a child, If she did well at school, Mm -hmm. her parents would take her out to McDonald's Mm -hmm. as a reward. Um, So she she associated doing good with rewarding herself with junk food. So here's the strange thing. It's like, or remember those times at the dinner table where your parents would say, well, you're not leaving the dinner table till you eat those vegetables, you know, it's, it's, or you're not going to get dessert till you eat those vegetables. So there's this sort of manipulation and this playoff and this, this idea about food being pleasurable or um, not so pleasurable, punishable. Yeah. You know, you've got to eat all that, you know, it's like, fuck, you know, we, we, and no doubt the parents are trying to do it out of love, but what they don't realize, it's probably setting up an emotional eating pattern for these children, which develop into a, like that groove in the record that just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's just very hard to change the track. So I think food is the easiest thing for, it was for me to change, but for somebody else, it could be the most difficult. You know, for for some, starting a meditation practice, practice or mindfulness practice can seem very easy for some, whereas for others, just the idea of sitting still for 20 minutes mm-hmm. could bring them into a state of panic and fear. And maybe when they were a child, they got locked in a, a room because they were being naughty. You got to go to your room and, and sit there for t- half an hour with nothing, mm-hmm. you know, so that idea of being alone and with your own thoughts could bring about that belief Mm. pattern back to life. I know of lots of kids that were locked in a room, for instance, for being naughty or sent to the naughty corner. You know, they can't talk to anyone. Don't talk to me. So meditation or mindfulness might trigger shit. (laughs) Maybe that I've never gotten into it. And I think I was put on timeout growing up, but I've never really gotten into meditation much. Maybe I'm scared. And then there's other things, you know, one of the, I mean, I just wrote a book called Heal. Uh, You know, a bit of a corny title, not heal. It stands for healthy eating and living, but 101 ways to, you know, deal with a modern world and, and put into practices. And we cover, I mean, I cover different topics in there from nutrition, like we spoke about, from mindfulness to connect, to connection to nature, um, to self-love, to relationships, to uh, creative outlets. Mm-hmm. And all of these things, you know, even connection to nature. You know, I love to go into the ocean, but there's so many people I go, well, you know, why don't you have a little swim in the ocean in the morning if you're near the beach or something? People are like, oh, I can't go in the ocean because I'm scared of sharks. Mm. You know, so they've got a, an emotional ne- a belief system around that nature or the ocean for them is dangerous. And other people might have a fear about going into, I think you call them the woods in America or <laughs> you know, into, we call it the bush. Mm-hmm. 
you know, but maybe they're scared of snakes or spiders or things or, you know, I was just in Northern California recently and they said there's mountain lions there. Yeah, I'm like, well, really? Mm. Fuck, you know? <laughs> you know? So, whereas other people, they could have had some amazing times with their family camping and things. So, I don't have a one size fit, fits all and what might be good for you might not be so good for me until we address our underlying emotional belief patterns and we can tell when we're triggered by something and generally when we're triggered by something that's a good indication that we may need to do some uh, deeper work there mm. and and work isn't really a good word to use because people associate work with non-pleasurable activities but sometimes but- it is to address issues with yourself it's not all fun and games. I, I like to use the word, it's an adventure. Mm-hmm. It's like those video games or adventure games that we used to play as kids, you know. It's an adventure. You know, it, it, we don't know what we're going to uncover, but we know that we're going on an adventure. Mm-hmm. And it could be, it could have elements of challenges in there, like any adventure does, or it could reap, you could reap great rewards. And it could be anything. It could be a multitude of these things, and you just don't know. How did you get into this kind of, this sounds a little bit like a journey, like a plant medicine journey and your new film coming up is called Awaken and it's kind of many forms of awakening your mind and all different things. But yeah, how did you get into this world of, of just like working on yourself or thinking about your past or noticing or being, pre- there's so many things that we've talked about today before we start recording that, that normal people don't think about. Well, I, I think everybody's normal. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think everyone's unique and um, beautiful in their own right and everyone's working on a- and going through the journey or the adventure of life the best way they can at mm-hmm. their particular time. And I, I'm very cautious. You know, I, I've been curious about this. I've been curious about who we are. Why do we think the way we think? Why... Do our parents behave the way they behave? Why is our schooling system set it up like this? Why is our government set up like this? Why is our food system set up like this? Why is religion set up like this? Why is spirituality mm. seeming like this this strange woo-woo thing? So I have a lot of questions. And I feel like the best way to answer them is to put yourself in a state of wonder and curiosity and to talk to people. And I love talking to experts in their chosen field. And I'm very cautious as well not to put all my eggs into one basket. Because I've done that in the past and it hasn't worked out for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's sometimes the best way. But interestingly enough, when you do put all your eggs in one basket, like years ago, 25 years ago, I decided that I was going to become a vegan because I heard some guru talk about it. And it made a lot of sense to me at the time. Now, I can't... I suffered ill health because of it. You know, I felt great for a little while, then I I didn't feel great. But looking back at it, it was a very pivotal part of my journey or very, I'm glad that I went through that journey. I think I'm glad that I went through it when I was 20 rather than trying to do it now as a 46 year old. You know, there's all this propaganda out there and the movie Game Changers and things like that. And I'm so glad that I did that when I was 20 because I'm like, like, that doesn't work. (laughs) You know, that doesn't work for a lot of people. But imagine if I was 46 now and with the pressure and whatever I have in my life and now wanting to be presented that information and thinking that's the right path. And then, I don't know, it's, I'm grateful that I've gone through that journey back then. So I'm just curious and I think one of the one of the greatest sayings or one of the greatest things that I ever heard was, "You only start to age or grow old when you think you have it all worked out. Mm-hmm. When you stop to have that curiosity and that wonder for, for mm-hmm. this amazing gift of life." Well, some people never have that, or some people I feel like give up and they get their first job. I keep kind of like getting down on people with these office jobs. That because I had an office job once and I felt like I was not here, you know, it, it took me out of that world. But then we're lucky enough to be on our path and being able to explore things and we have more flexibility. Well, everyone's on their path and the office job for some people might be maybe offering them exactly what they want at this point in time. 
I uh, th- mentioned to you earlier, I spent 20 years working in a kitchen, like a box. And uh, my average working week was 80 hours minimum. And, you know, through that experience, I learned so much about myself. Uh, do I want to do it now? No. Could I do it again? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but my preference would be not to do that because I've done that. And sometimes, like, for you to say that you're down on people doing an office job, it's like, well, it could be a great catalyst for that person, you know, to go through that and realize that, you know, for some they'll be like, you know what, I tried that. I did my best work there for five or ten years and, you know what, now it's time for me to take a different path. Um, and for others, it might be their, it might be their calling. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very hard for me to judge somebody because, you know, if somebody has an office job and they're getting – if they're happy and if they're, if it's ticking all the boxes for them, mm-hmm. which I know a lot of people that are very happy doing their job. Um, there's certain jobs out there I go, whoa, I, that, that wouldn't suit me. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I'm a little bit scared to do that. Maybe there'd be a trigger for me <laughs> why that, why that uh, doesn't mm-hmm. appeal to me. But I, I can't judge. Can't judge. Well, what, what would you say for people who are stuck in that, but they want more out of life? Um, I would say that for them to be curious about what else is out there. And I, I, I guess there's the I, weekend. There's a lot of time outside of work. I've learned a long time ago not never to tell anybody what they should do. I think should is a, is a dangerous word in our vocabulary, especially when we're saying to somebody what they should or shouldn't do. So I, I do my best to not use those words. Um, if somebody is listening and they are in that position and they're curious about what else is out there, then explore it and explore it in a way that feels right for you. For somebody, it might be, you know, as you said, on the weekends, they might spend their Sunday trying a different, uh, work project. You know, they could do work experience for three months to see what that's like. Or when they have their week off holiday, they might decide to immerse themselves into something else. But I would say, because here's the thing, I've been a chef for a long time and with the popularity of these cooking shows like MasterChef and My Kitchen Rules and Top Chef and mm-hmm. all these shows, and I just saw a new one with David Chang on Netflix oh, just, just came out, Chef's Table and all mm-hmm. this, it glorifies the profession of cooking. And I can tell you that it's not a mm. <laughs> glamorous job mm. from somebody that has experienced it. You can get, you can have an amazing relationship with food and it can give you, it can offer you so much. But I used to see a lot of people that were accountants or lawyers or doctors and they'd watch MasterChef or one of these shows and go, that's it. I want to oh, work with food. I'm going to quit my job. Yeah. But they don't realize what that industry is like. Yeah. And I was, I would, Generally say, if you're interested, why don't you give up one weekend a month for the next year, go and do some work experience in a, in a top end restaurant. There's no use working in a, in a inferior one. If you're going to really give this a shot, go work at the best and then see how you feel. Mm-hmm. Actually get a taste of it, like immerse yourself into it and see whether it is exactly what you want to do. Yeah, well, it yeah. could be a rude that's, awakening. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, I read Kitchen Confidential, Anthony Bourdain's book, and it, it was intense. And but, but your experience—I mean, you have what t- most popular show in Australia, the cooking your cooking show. It's top show for like ten years or something. Yeah, we've, I've been fortunate enough to host a, um, a television show in Australia that's um, been very popular. I get to judge people's cooking, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? and it's really interesting for me because. I'm not really a judgmental person and I put myself in that position or I took on the role as a, I guess as a mentor, but also as a judge. So it's a really interesting space that I've put myself into because I am, I do wear a a judgmental hat based around what these people Mm -hmm. cook. So it's, um, it's a really good space for me to keep grounded in as well. (laughs) So what? So people are curious. I know you don't like to give advice, and I like that because I asked you if you wanted to be part of this game changers thing, and then you're like, "Oh, well, I don't want to say what someone should or should not do." 
right? You don't, you want to tell them don't go vegan. You'd be like, try it and see what happens. But what? So so going to plant medicine, you don't. What do you think people who who are kind of scared or they don't know about it? Is that something they could try? Like, how do you even invest, investigate that if you want to be curious in that realm? Yeah, it's an in, it's a very interesting one because. To the best of my knowledge and from everything that I've ever read and anybody that I've ever interviewed about plant medicines or these uh, psychedelic journeys, it is it is never some. If somebody says to somebody that they should do it, mm-hmm. take caution with mm-hmm. that because nobody can tell you what you should do, especially when you're looking at a very, very, very powerful tool for transformation. You'll either be interested in it and and if you are, then you will find a way when you are ready for that experience to happen and understanding the legalities of where you are. And I would always recommend that you do as much research as possible and work uh, and and find out who in the field is having great results and is who who is very respected because i know there's cowboys and cowgirls out there that are just doing shamanic plant medicine ceremonies everywhere around the world so my advice like anything is find out where you're getting your information Mm -hmm. from and don't listen to me either Mm -hmm. but for something that is could be life shattering uh, and paradigm shattering and belief shattering and ego shattering and where you can face your own death and <laughs> immortality. Um, be wise in your, in your adventure in this. Um, and for some people, maybe it's, it's just will never be on their radar and that's cool too. And it's like, as you were talking about paths before, some people just will never adopt this way of eating you know and it's that's cool it's it's their journey you know mm-hmm. and, uh, often a lot of people say well people you do you tell people what to eat I can I never you know if I'm invited to speak somewhere then if I've got a stage and people mm-hmm. know what they're coming for then mm-hmm. I'm happy to discuss that um, I have a social media page on Instagram and, and Facebook and I'm very happy to share my life and my philosophy on that page. But I can tell you one thing. I've never, ever, ever been onto somebody else's page and said, hey, you're doing it wrong. Mm. Or why would you do it that way? Mm. It's, it's, that's not my place. I like that philosophy. So with the, with the game changers thing that you're doing, um, I often have a lot of people say, what do you think of this? You know, last year it was, or two years ago, it was, what What do you think about what the health? Before that, it was forks over knives. And before that, it was the China study. And this time it's game changers. And no doubt next year Mm -hmm. it'll be something else. And we've had Cowspiracy and we've had all of these different films that have come out or different books that have come out. And my, my message is if that feels like the right path for you, that the plant-based movement or the vegan movement is calling, you're attracted to it. Number one is why are you attracted to it? Is it health reasons? Is it um, sustainability and environment issues? Is it animal rights issues? Is it because you are feeling lonely and you want to be part of a tribe and that tribe seems pretty you know, vibrant and inclusive and righteous Righteous, and is there an element of um, abuse that you might have had in your life, whether it be physical, sexual or some other emotional abuse or spiritual abuse um, by yourself or from others that you feel like you need to right a wrong and this seems to be a really easy way or righteous way for you to right a wrong by protecting what you would call innocent beings, um, then meditate on that and think about that and maybe speak to a therapist about it before you adopt this principle to find out what is the trigger or what is the attraction to this. Or 
try it for yourself for six months or a year, get your blood test done before, during, and keep analyzing over the years that you want to adopt it. And if at any point you don't feel congruent with that ideology anymore, or you do feel congruent with that belief system about veganism or vegetarianism or plant-based diet, but your body isn't delivering the results that and your mind isn't delivering the results that you hoped was optimum or sustainable, opti- optimal human health, then have a look at what might be missing. Um, but all of those things, you know, because everybody comes at it for different reasons. And one thing that I do know is that for me, it was about wanting to look after my health and the planet's health and the animal's health. I wasn't really an active animal rights activist back then and but i am more now being a meat eater Mm -hmm. it's bizarre Mm -hmm. like now i eat meat and now i care about the welfare of the meat that i'm eating more so than i did when i was a vegan you know the vegan was actually a purely health of myself and the planet Mm -hmm. the animal rights were never really that much of an issue for me but now they are it's like well i choose to eat this type of animal that's been raised this way and cared for and we even have pigs and chickens on our farm now and we're going to eat those pigs very soon and i look at these animals and i know i'm going to eat them but they're happy and they're running around and they're Mm -hmm. i'm excited about the prospect of being able to raise my own food because i feel like that's the next step for me we're part of the system now instead of being separated from the system oh you know what you know, when I buy bacon, for instance, from the shops, and I, um, I question that sometimes, or quite often, I'm like, what were these exactly fed? And were they running around like my piggies outside mm. here? And would, you know, my pigs are so happy, and I know that they're going to taste very good. And um, I know that that's part of the cycle. So there's also the new angle that I'm sh- sure you've discovered when you've gone to the meat eating side that. Maybe this this narrative isn't correct, and this vegan narrative that you for health or for the environment. Hmm. Because they, they, they some things they may have right, but some I, I'm just finding that maybe the system we have now isn't good, and maybe this is, this industrial system is not good for the environment. But there is a way that you can raise animals that it could be beneficial to the environment. Yeah, I think all our systems are pretty well. Fucked. <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I really do. I think the medical system, the the um, f- agricultural farming system that we have at the moment. I think our political system. I think our religious system is everything. It seems to be out of balance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so much of it is is so out of alignment. And I think if we want to bring it back into alignment, the best thing we can do is is practice what we preach and live by example and, you know, just look after ourselves, and from that connect with others and do the best that we can and share information. I mean, our system is, is so broken, um, but there are solutions. I'm an I'm a eternal optimist and I do believe there are solutions to all of these systems. I, I think there's a solution to our medical system. I think there is one to our environmental um, catas- catastrophe that we have at the moment with pollution and plastics and all of that. I think we have uh, a solution to our agricultural system, you know, with holistic farming management. And no doubt we will keep tweaking it and tweaking it and new information will come. And I think that's what we have to be really open about is that what we know now will be superseded in five years by new information, even better information. But on the other hand, the system will likely not want to change in the way that we would like it to change as quickly as we would like it to change because there's so much vested interest and so much money invested for the system to retain, to keep going in the way it's going because there's there's money to be, to be not only made but sustained for the shareholders. And you look at it across the board from the medical associate, pharmaceutical, the agricultural um it's um the environmental aspects of what we create so 
you know, I don't have the answers, but I do believe that, you know, if we can adopt some of these solutions, and I believe holistic farming management and eating a um, omnivorous diet and to stop monocropping and to stop spraying of these poisons onto our food, which ends up in the environment, is a, is a really good place to start. I love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, connectiveness was a lot of the th- themes we've been talking about today. And... And I, I and other people have these ideas that why this whole sort of vegan movement started was a, a bit of a disconnection from how our food system works. And if we move away from cities and, and don't understand how animals could and should be raised, that if you get too separated from that, then problems start arising because you don't know that an animal has to die to eat it. Well, I'll tell you what, if the... If the um if the vegan, vegetarian, and carnivore, ancestral, paleo way, keto groups got together and actually tried to awaken the standard American or standard Australian eaters, you know, because that's probably like 90%, you know, the vegan and vegetarian and paleo community probably only equates, and I'm only guessing, mm. but maybe 10 to 15 to 20% of their population in the Western society. Yeah, less, I think. Less, maybe 10%. Yeah. You know, I see there's, there's this conflict between us, and it's like, well, we're actually, there's 90% of the population that's enforcing through their actions this fucked up system. Mm-hmm. Yet there seems to be this conflict between vegans and the carnivores or the vegans and the paleos. And yeah. it's like, really? We're. we're what is that conflict doing? It's nearly like a distraction to the big picture. It's like, how do we actually change the doctors, the hospital system, the farmers, the 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 ninety percent or ninety whatever it is percent of the population that couldn't give a fuck? That's just eating whatever's there, and they've got no idea about what health means. At least with the vegan and the paleo, we're concerned about our health. Yeah, yeah. You know, so we're almost on the same team. So we I've, are on the same team. There, like one guy. There's a guy who follows me. Called his name is Carnivore is Vegan, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. And then also, I did this that talk with the lady, and they tried to pit me up against her as like the vegan versus carnivore. And we found out it's like, oh wait, we're almost the same. You know, her diet was similar to mine. She just had a little less animal foods than me. She ate sustainable fish and eggs and she didn't have any refined grains, sugars, or vegetable oils. I'm like, yeah, me too. So we have like the same diet. You're just eating more plants That's than it. I am. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, a lot of people count calories and macronutrients and fats and all this shit. Mm. And um, it's like, really? Like, just some people thrive more on a more meat-based diet. Other people thrive better at period of time for on a plant-based, more plant-based foods in their system. And I think we just need to be flexible about what suits us then. Me, I enjoy more meat and seafood in my diet than I once did. And it seems to be working a lot better for me at this particular point in time. Five years down the track, I don't know. Depends on where I'm living, what emotional stresses I'm going through. Um, Who knows? I don't know. I'm, I'm open. I I love that. I love the openness because, well, that's what we're trying to do with Sapien Framework. We're not even calling it a diet because it's like, yeah, there's a big healthy like path that you could be on and it it doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe it changes. Maybe you're pregnant and things you shift it one way or maybe you got an injury and it shifts another way. And I think, you know, for the system to change with the food, I think we need to really change the the guidelines because nothing is going to happen until that has changed. Mm. And I know there's good people working on it at the moment in the States. The, um, Nina Teichel. Nina with her uh, nutritional council. Nutrition coalition. Coalition, that's it. Um, you know, and if anybody can do it, I think she and her friends can. I just saw Gary Torbs in Australia recently, and I know he's part of it. And there's some good, good, smart people that are, that are really passionate about this. Mm. And I think that's really – I don't think we should be debating the – the vegans and the vegetarians, to be honest with you, I think mm. I think the bigger challenge is the the guidelines and the ninety percent. Yeah, the people. The guidelines affect those ninety percent. The guidelines affect the ninety percent, and I think if we can really, that should be the, the focus. That really should be the focus, mm. and that's been my focus in in Australia. A lot of my posts over the last eight years or messages is 
the guidelines are, are completely wrong because they're completely funded by uh, multinational food corporations and religious ideologies. So once we can change that, you know, I don't even know whether we can, but as long as we keep putting that awareness out, because if we get caught up between battling between the vegan and the carnivore, be vegan and keto, whatever it is, it, it's just a distraction from the big mm -hmm. from the big prize, mm -hmm. I, I believe. So that's that's I'm gonna I'm gonna use the word should. That's uh -huh. where I think we should mm -hmm. be putting our efforts into. And that's why we made the film The Magic Pill. And I deliberately made it not to attack the vegans mm -hmm. because I felt like if I go and we had material that was very easy to do that and I pulled it out. Um, my director wanted to put it in. I said, no, 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 that's, that's not our, that's not the battle here. That's well, I shouldn't say it. It's not my battle. Mm. I don't see that as the biggest threat here. I see the multinational food corporations, the dietary guidelines. We need to explain this to the masses. Mm -hmm. And and your next film is called The Magic Plant, which mm -hmm. is before Awaken. Correct. So we've just finished filming a for the last year a, a documentary on cannabis called The Magic Plant. And just like the magic pill, I was like, is there a magic pill for all our health issues? And there isn't. You know, diet is not the magic pill. It can be a very instrumental tool. And I do believe that long-term sustainable health, we need that good foundation of, of good um good nutrition in our system. But I know people that are extremely happy and healthy that don't eat well. I know so many people that eat really well, like what we promote, but are miserable. <laughs> they count yeah, that's the, not they, right. Or, they're yeah. counting the cars. Or, well, and they haven't even dealt with it, their other issues, you mm. know, the, the connection to themselves and those belief patterns. And so the magic plant came about because I kept hearing about cannabis being this magic plant that could cure us mm -hmm. cure cancer you, cure you epilepsy you weren't like into it before you don't know much about it or no i was an ex an expert and i'm still not an expert mm -hmm. i'm a lot more informed now than i was and my take on it is that it also can be a a, a tool that can be used for for health in many ways from our physical through to our emotional and also spiritual well-being and I find cannabis can cross those body, mind, and spirit. Um, it can have an impact on all those three elements of us in a very profound way. And again, I'm, I'm not here to say that it's don't put all your eggs into the basket of the cannabis. But I'm also saying we shouldn't discount its role in our overall health. And um, now nowadays, I use it as part of my toolkit. Mm -hmm. in many different ways and um, I wanted to explore that from its origins and its spiritual and a holistic use and how humans have evolved with it through to how we use it as a food how we use it as a medicine and how we need to respect this plant because it is such a very powerful plant and like anything like food it can also be abused mm -hmm. and we see that you know the, the classic stoner is mm -hmm. what i would consider um, some ways to be uh, a not a respect respectful use of the plant mm -hmm. I think it comes back to set and setting an intention and, you know, we can eat it, we can juice it, we can make a tea out of it, we can make an oil out of it, we can make a balm out of it and put it on us, we can use it as aromatherapy, we can just um, look at it, mm -hmm. you know, we can use it for food, um, we can use it for fibre, we can use it for fuel, we can use it as a as a rotational crop to help other crops grow, we can use it to, to help build soil. In a, in a beautiful way. So there's many uses to this and, and hopefully at the end of the film when somebody watches it, they'll have a really good uh, understanding of what this plant is and what it isn't. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. And it, you know, it may not res resonate with everybody, but um, I'm pretty happy with what we've covered. Well, it's cool. I think no, a lot of people, it's, it's kind of like a really dividing issue. So it's the most controversial controversial is the word yeah on the planet and uh, i find yeah. it fascinating yeah well this is a good time we got dr gary stepping in um did you want to talk about any of your experiences like there i've had some pretty powerful experiences i've only done on some like plant medicine journeys a couple times in my life 
but um I, I don't know just we talked about something you don't have to talk about them but just how it, it changed you or what you've seen or like what kind of uh it, they seem pretty powerful yeah from my understanding and my limited amount of research that i've done on them they're called entheogens and entheogens means to connect with the divine within would be i guess the the best way that i could put it into my terms and from what i've learned so what does that mean to connect to the divine within it means that we already have these molecules in us so we have a endocannabinoid system we have uh dmt in us in our bodies we have 5-meo dmt in us endogenously so we already have these <laughs> this communication with these molecules already and yet there are these certain plants or animals out in the universe out on the planet that also have these and we can have a higher dose of them when we consume them and or we can have a micro dose of them as well so it all comes down to dosage i think with everything whether it's sugar and i've said this many times before i don't think sugar is evil you know i think it's just a plant mm -hmm. that people are overdosing on mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and we, g'day gary uh, g'day. and i think dosage is is really important with everything mm -hmm. we can abuse anything and looking around western population we're abusing sugar and carbohydrates it's, and toxic chemicals and people are abusing cannabis people are abusing some people are abusing different plant medicines Absolutely. out there no doubt um, people are abusing antipsychotic drugs. They're abusing pharmaceuticals. They're abusing themselves, you know. So entheogen means to connect with the divine within or open the divine within. So these plant journeys or medicine journeys that we can go on, um, they're called master plants or teacher plants. So they teach us about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Depending on the dose, you can teach, learn a lot about yourself <laughs> on a heroic dose mm -hmm. but you can also learn about yourself on a you know a homeopathic dose or a mic micro dose as they talk about so again I, I don't want to say what's right for somebody you know about dosage because i don't know i'm not the mm -hmm. expert and i've had i've been microdosing different things for quite some time and i've also had full-blown heroic journeys and they can be transformative you know some of some some of the lower doses are equally as transformative as the full-blown ones and a lot less scary <laughs> mm. well yeah i because i just had a scary one where i thought i was i didn't know i did something so i thought i was just gone forever and that i was i found a new part of the universe where i mean there was no physical universe it was only emotions and thoughts and mind i thought that was it and i thought it was great because i figured it out but i also thought i was stuck there forever i don't know there's so much to learn there's so much more out there i know i want to pass the mic to gary too but if you want to if you have any other things that you want to say on that it, it's powerful yeah i mean i think there's so much you just said that uh i mean that got me excited one of the things you said was uh you know there's people abusing toxic chemicals right toxic is dose dependent mm -hmm. right like every most part compounds have a toxic dose right so a lot of the idea of something being toxic or not is a social construct mm -hmm. it's what we we have vilified salt right and we've made sugar okay mm -hmm. right we vilified cannabis but we made antidepressants like ssris okay now I'm going through, like we've talked about, my own kind of process of realizing that, well, maybe we got all of this backwards. Mm -hmm. And maybe, like you said, everything has a role. We just need to be a little bit more thoughtful about what we're doing. Um, when it comes to the psychoactive stuff, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, we don't understand the drugs we're talking about. You know, uh, even something as simple as cannabis, which, you know, you're making this great movie about. And we don't even know which strains are the most healing. What's the right dose? How often we should. We, we haven't done real, real research on this stuff. We don't have real answers. Um, so a lot of it comes down to, you know, 
personal experience looking back on you know history human history but i feel like we're just scratching the surface on even the concept of the entheogen and theogen right mm -hmm. like we're just scratching the surface on what that really means i wonder if maybe societies in the past had an even better understanding than us right and now we're sort of catching up we're going back and saying hmm it's similar to how we we go back and look at diet through the lens of ancestral health and we're like oh well we kind of knew what we were doing right well mm -hmm. maybe uh psychoactive psychedelic uh drug you know fueled uh, experiences we need to go back and think about those through an ancestral lens you know um so man i, I think that we've really created um a toxic environment when it comes to even talking about this stuff, mm. you know? And I think, uh, again, why I'm so excited about your work is because, you know, your movie is going to let people think about this stuff. Hopefully that's the goal, right? Is let people have an education so they could think about this stuff with a big, more open mind. Well, the intention always is to plant some seeds to yeah. create a curiosity. So I'm not here to give anybody the answers. Mm hmm. Um, and even in the the magic pill, I didn't really give too many. I, I gave a, you know, there's a part in the film we we're talking about before. I said, eat organic. You know, nobody can debate that. You know that that's not bad. Eat nose to tail. Yeah. I don't think anybody can debate that either. Um, make some broth. I don't think anyone can. I mean, that's eating nose to tail. Uh, intermittent fast occasionally. I don't think anyone can debate that either these days. If, if it suits your body type, uh, you know, maybe intermittent fasting doesn't work for everybody at this particular point in time. But, you know, once you start to eat this mm -hmm. way, then it probably can become a, a bit of a, a routine maybe. Maybe not for everybody, but for some. We talk about eating fermented foods. You know, I think that can work for a lot of people. Um, eat seasonally. I don't think anybody can debate that. But but they can't. Be, but also, a lot of people have no idea. Probably not the listeners of this podcast, but a lot of people, the majority of Americans, have no idea what you just said. Mm. They the concept of intermittent fasting is foreign to them. The concept of a healthy bone broth, they've never had it before, right? That was stories about from their grandmas, mm. right? Um, okay, the organic people know about, but even. <laughs> Even that they don't really understand what, what what we're after, which is to get to a more clean, you know, less um, modified or altered product. Mm. And with the cannabis film, I mean, we're not there to say that cannabis is that everybody should have it or smoke it or grow it or anything like that. I mean, the where I got to with the film was I created a relationship with it that was a lot more empowering for me than I had when I was a teenager and I was right. smoking it because when I first smoked it. I was 16. I didn't know what I was getting. I didn't know what it was sprayed with. I didn't yeah. know what strain it was. I was scared of getting caught by my parents or the bullies at the park, you know, getting bashed or the cops finding us. So all, all of a sudden, before I've even put it in my mouth to light it, I'm in a state of- Your intentions. I'm in fear, fight or yeah. flight, paranoid, anxious. What the fuck? I think that was probably the scariest, scaredest I've ever been in my life was lighting up that first joint to a degree of something. And as I know, we create these belief patterns. So that set me up for every time I smoked, I'd be paranoid. Whereas now when I smoke or I ingest cannabis, I know that it's organic. I know what strain it is, what level of THC to CBD. I know how many, ter what terpenes are in there. So I, I already know exactly what sort of outcome that I'm going to have if I take that one or if I take this one or if I take that one that's a great one for going to bed this one's a great one for me to be creative in the daytime if I choose to and some days I'm just like you know what that's I'm I don't need it today I don't right. want it today you know I listen to my body and it's um but I can't help but think, imagine if I was that young kid again, and I'm not endorsing this for children, but I'm just going back, let's just say my first experience with cannabis. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I was sitting down with friends that I trusted or family members, even better, and I had somebody to say, this was grown 
in this region and it was grown in the sun they didn't use any fertilizer this has a um, this cultivar here or the strain has this level of thc and this one has a higher cbd so if you have this one you mightn't get tired you mightn't get anxious you mightn't have any of that paranoia and you might just feel a little bit more creative we, so why don't we ingest that in a micro dose see how you feel and we might go for a walk through the through the garden or the park or what or the bush or whatever it might be or on the beach and you'll be with your friends it'll be daylight so much information right like you have so much information that's so empowering to drive that experience right and what you were describing decades ago was not having this information like and probably being full of misinformation had no idea no idea right it's called marijuana and you're going to get high well, what, the, what 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 does getting high mean yeah. you know, no one explained it and and i interviewed a guy recently a doctor and i said what is what does getting high mean and he said just heightened state of awareness and he said it's an amplifier so it's an amplifier that's what i was so if you're already paranoid and anxious yeah. or you've got strange voices in your head that's going to be amplified if you're already chilled out like some people, it'll just amplify that and make them even more chilled out, depending on what they're what they're having. But you know, if you're watching a movie, you know the movie might you might get more involved because all of a sudden you're you've got heightened sense of what you're visually watching or hearing at the same time. Or if you're eating something, you've got heightened sense of what you're tasting. If you're watching and if a your band, intention is too, if your intention is I'm going to enjoy this movie more, oh, I'm going to really enjoy this lunch. And so you go into an experience like this directed, not just lost and scared and worried that something bad's going to happen, but I'm going to have this kind of experience. And so then you manifest it and the drug just kind of helps that exp helps you go in that direction. And I had no idea. I interviewed a, a spiritual historian about cannabis who's written many books about it. And he said himself, he goes, whenever I do meditation, I smoke cannabis first <clears throat> because it's an amplifier mm -hmm. for the meditative state for him. He goes, other people do yoga. Other people do a workout because it heightens that awareness <sighs> of being in that moment or whatever they're trying to do, depending on the strain that they're having. You know, they're not going to usually smoke something that's going to knock them out. Yeah. Or it could be some CBD oil before bed. Who, or who knows? You know, it's not a one size fits all. And I think it's nearly like the diet thing. I'm very careful to say that one diet fit doesn't fit all because I hear the carnivore side, I hear the vegan side, I hear the paleo side, I hear the keto, I hear the the Western A price that we can soak the grains and they're not going to hurt us or we can ferment the milk or the dairy and it's not going to hurt us. And I've learnt over my time, I'm still experimenting, I'm still tweaking it. I still don't have the perfect formula. One, to think that it's, it's, I think it's also very simple, simple. It's too simple to just go down an ideology of paleo or keto or, you know, this works. It's not. We have different genetic predispositions too, right? We all have, we come from a different lineage. We have different carb dependencies. We, our gut microbiomes have been changed in different ways. And, and the biggest thing that is often overlooked is our emotional mm -hmm. belief patterns with food or our emotional identity that it's attached to food. And I think we've talked about it, you know, whether you're Italian or whether you're um, Indian, um, whether you're Chinese or wherever you are from, you have a, a DNA sort of attached to these foods. So could you imagine if you've if you're Italian and you grew up eating pasta and all of a sudden someone goes, that shit ain't good for you. And I always bring it back to that's crazy. Right? Well, you're a human being. Work out what's good for a human being, but that might not override their sense of identity about being Italian. And, and a lot of these senses of identities, people will often bring this up to me in clinic, right? And I'm just while I acknowledge and I appreciate it, they're not that old, right? These ideas of an Italian eats all this pasta. It's a, a hundred years old. It's not like it's been around a lot of, even the concept I just use Italian is like American Italian. We Americanize the concept of Italian. So what we consider Italian food is really just American. It's Italians that came here and made food and they mm -hmm. were poor and they were immigrants and they had to like, 
throw this pizza and pasta and all yeah, that shit. It's not re- <laughs> that's not Italian food, right? Um, it it made me think of like so. I just came back from a trip to visit my grandma's in New York and Brighton Beach, which is all Russian people, and they had this brand new beautiful supermarket. I, I'd love to show you guys the video, but it's just. I mean, it's row after row of prepared, beautiful Russian, Uzbek, Georgian, all this Eastern European food. And nary a carb. So there's there's pastries, right? There's baked goods, pastries on the top. But all the salads, all the entrees, everything is organ meat. Mm. It's salads with um, just all the colors of the rainbow and... All the meats. Omnivore. I mean, it's just, it's so, it's such a different, it, like an American would be, I could, what am I even looking at? Like, mm. what, what is this? You have, you have like a beet with a, with a, with a piece of fish. Uh, wh- what? Like yes, it, it does, it, mm. yeah, like it, it's, it looks very similar to the beautiful plates that you post for Thank your, you. that you cook for your kids and you have these beautiful plates and then they're so thoughtfully constructed and. Um, I'm just walking through this Russian supermarket and it's that's the food that I grew up eating. And and sure, it's become a bit Americanized and they do eat everything with bread. But even that oftentimes is black rye bread, mm. which tends to be a little lower glycemic index. So there's just there's so much. I think we know <sighs> there's so much. I think we know the most common inflammatory foods that we have these days that no longer resemble what our ancestor would eat. And I yeah. think first and foremost is dairy and our, and our grain yeah. and legume to a degree because how that's how that's farmed these days yeah. across the board. I mean, there's obviously certain, um, certain things. I mean, there are some great organic dairy farmers um, out there, few and far between. And there's the occasional um, person doing holistic farming and proper crop, crop rotation. But, Majority, we could probably, again, the debate's probably out that those foods shouldn't probably make up a large part of anybody's diet. And for some, they should never touch them ever again in yeah. their life because they've got autoimmune disease, they've got type 2 diabetes, they've got mental issues which cross the blood-brain barrier. So, so my approach always in my last 10 or 15 cookbooks is a paleo approach and it's meat and vegetables because... I know that that's pretty much if people stick to that, no matter who they are, it'll generally make them feel a lot better. And all that, and even looking at American culture, all that was part of it in the beginning, Yeah. right? Chicken soup was not this, you know, drab broth with nothing in there. It was this fatty, rich chicken broth. It's not what it looks like anymore, you know? Um no salt reduced, no fat. So, yeah, all, all the <laughs> no good stuff. All, no, no chicken. All the good stuff has been taken out, and what's left is really a nutrient deplete food, mm-hmm. like a very, sure. like a very, like yeah, hollow food that makes you hungrier. And ugh, I, I, I don't know. I, w- I wish I could take you guys both back to Brighton Beach right now and just show you this array of all the meats. I want to go to Russia. No. Oh, <laughs> Russia, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to go to Russia. I left when I was three, and I've never been back. Yeah, we'll put it on Maybe the list. one day. You never and know. Australia. Maybe you need to do a book for Russia, brother. Oh, oh. boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I had somebody the other day, actually, from Russia. Uh, my, one of my TV shows is is broadcast over in Russia, and people are like, there's nothing like this in Russia. No yeah. one's talking about this. Yeah, but I, I wonder if because there maybe there's still I've not been there, but maybe they're still anchored in their traditions a bit more. Mm, I don't know true. how how much of you know the Western world has affected them the way it, it's here. Um, I definitely think there's fast food. No, for sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just I was in Brighton Beach and I was just watching all these older people. Mm. They're all in their 80s and 90s and they're strong and they're robust. Yeah. And uh, don't want to mess with them. Don't want to mess with those grandmas, and they're eating chicken liver, mm-hmm. spoonful of chicken liver. Like they're not messing around. They're eating real delicious foods, mm. and it's not. And I get. And again, I think this just echoing something we talked about earlier. It's not a piece of frozen liver that you muscle down. It's delicious foods. These are part of our traditional you know life i don't know how we got from drugs to uh, food but to me it's all really very well connected it's all it's all what you put in your body is what you get out um and let's also not forget sunshine 
<laughs> love sunshine. We're on a sunshine kick. I guess we have to wrap this up at some point. Um, thanks for stepping in, Dr. Gary. Thank you for You have some more patience? You get... uh, I'm, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're trying to do this in the middle of the day in the clinic. Um, but... I think we should wrap it up. I've had, just to to wrap it up, I've had five patients this morning, four of whom got a recommendation to watch The Magic Pill. (laughs) Two of them got to eat uh, the nose to tail as like, not even even just buy the company, but like this is as as a concept. Mm. Like check out the website as a concept. People don't get it. They have no idea. I've sold uh, like four vitamin D supplements because their vitamin Ds were less than 20. Less wow. than 20, guys. Think about that. Vitamin D is an essential hormone. What's the average? I mean, okay, this is a great question. Cool. Uh, average, th- this is something that me and Brian are talking a lot about. Y- it is, okay, it used to be that a normal vitamin D level was 40 or above. Uh-huh. Okay, I forget. It's like nanograms per whatever that yeah. standard is, but 40 or above. Um, during my training, they moved it to 30 and above. So 20 to 30 was insufficiency, 20 and below was deficiency. That's just because the population was so low that they just lowered it because it was low. It's not because... It- I've got some crazy conspiracy theories to what think... what does it go up to? It goes up to like 100, 120. Yeah, I, think, 100 is- I think mine was either 80 or 90 or 100. Was- that's, that's, a safe, that's a yeah. safe and healthy... And, you know, we have this uh, colleague of ours who's a dentist, and he, uh, Joel... Uh, Joe Gould, and he he talks about it as it's like a reservoir, mm-hmm. right? And you you build up that reservoir during the sum the, the summer during the sun, and you want to be at 80, 90, right? And then you know the winter time comes, you get less sun exposure. Well, for most people, and, and that reservoir comes down, and you're maybe you're down in the fifties or forty, but that's still okay. The problem is back to your question: is what's the average vitamin D level? I see, and I check a vitamin D on almost every patient because I believe very strongly it has so much to do with our health. 24, mm. 25. And that's already insufficiency even by our new standard, which I don't agree with. Mm. And so I'm now strongly recommending aggressive, and it's not enough for, for sun exposure, right? Sun can do so much. Most people are not going to spend that much time in the sun. They work indoors. They're sitting behind a computer. They're not doing exercise outdoors. Most people are exercising in a gym with these leds that aren't it's it's really a setup for chronic disease right like even taking the food out of the equation even taking the mental health stuff which is a lot of the drug conversation Mm. out of the equation if you're not living a life consistent with our evolutionary origins which is being outside using your body interacting with humans if you're not doing those things you're way behind the eight ball like you're you're way behind and so Simple things like vitamin D, which are not emphasized enough by physicians. Um, uh, a whole po- like I started recommending to patients. I have these supplements. I think you have a line that that's similar, where you take organ meats and dry yeah. them up, and you give them as a pill. Because good luck trying to convince someone to eat liver or an adrenal gland. But if you dry it up, put it in a pill. That's a great way to sneak it in there, right? I had four liver tablets just you before I came in today. Hopped off the it. plane, took it. Do you do any adrenal gland support? I got adrenal gland as well. I started taking an adrenal supplement recently, and it has n- noticeably, noticeably changed my uh, my ability to like extend the day and keep myself kind of rolling at a high level. It's really powerful. Yeah, well, I think it's seven o'clock in the morning for me here from where I just was, and I I think I had three or four hours sleep on the plane on that forty-eight hour. Pete, what's the name of your supplement? That line, because I I Heal. really. Heal. The, Heal is the name of the supplement line as well, okay? And that's available in the States? Or you got to order it online? I think we ship to the States, yeah. We've yeah. got liver and um, we've got heart about to launch. Then we've got brain and we've got bone marrow. And, um, yeah, I'm going to keep adding, keep on adding. But there is a um, uh, local company here in the States that does adrenals. Uh, ancient some- Ancestral. Ancestral. Ancestral supplements. Actually, t- I'm talking to them about if they, they want to, you know, help back the show. And... Um, it's a good idea. I think yeah. it's, it's really powerful because it's this, uh, it's the concept of nose to tail. It's like the only way we can really convince people to eat nose to tail because it's very hard for someone, even bone broth is hard to convince people mm. to to think of as a health food. See, I love oysters and every time I post a photo of oysters, uh, people cringe because people don't like eating them anymore. So I made an <sighs> oyster supplement. That, <sighs> and um, So smart. Yeah, so I'm doing whole food supplements at the moment. 
That's funny. I, I wrote that down a year ago when we we're we we're yeah, starting our sure. sapien stuff. I was like, we need to do whole food supplements. I didn't know about this stuff. I, I was I think I said oyster. I want to do fish eyes too. Like fish eyes have like a lot of vitamin A and like love. Which comes to this whole point of we don't need more and more and more studies. We need common sense. Mm-hmm. I talk about this on a lot of podcasts and a lot of platforms because I just think it's so important, especially as a physician. Um, it's great to have studies. It's great to have research. But we have common sense. We have human history and we could lean on that and realize that we, we, we know what to do. We just have to use our brains and separate ourselves from the, from the current culture and really like lean into our history and our ancestry hard, lean hard into it. Mm-hmm. And that's all I try to do and encourage my patients to see. So if, if someone has, are you Italian background? Well, did you know that real Italian background, this is what they ate? Or, oh, you're Russian. Okay, well, what's the, like, what did grandma make you eat, right? Because mm-hmm. it wasn't force feeding you vegetables like we do here in America, mm-hmm. you know? Like, that. that's not what we did historically. Yeah, I don't do that to my children either. Kids don't want to eat them. And there's a reason behind it. <laughs> there's a reason behind it. And we don't, it's not that we need to give people artificial things, but now we have to artificially bypass the current sort of dilemma, the current uh, milieu of thought, which is cereal for breakfast and, you know. Yeah, my kids have, they have steak and eggs pretty much every day for breakfast. And I'm so jealous of, uh, for the, I'm so jealous of your kids because you post, the people that don't follow Pete, like he posts the most beautiful pictures of all the foods that he makes for his kids. And by the way, I, ha- I wanted to mention this earlier, the skateboarding thing yeah. is so freaking cool, man, because... Yeah. You know, it really anchors you to to the earth and like that movement, that dynamic motion through the half pipe. It's really like a powerful. It's in the flow. It's in the, the, well, flow, state, the flow state. Flow state. Yeah. I'm a rollerblader, so oh. I, I everyone makes fun of me for it. <laughs> Brian makes fun. I have these big rollerblades with big old wheels that let me go off road, and I am just all over the valley rollerblading, awesome. and people look at me like I'm crazy. Awesome. But I feel freaking amazing rollerblading. You're outside, you're in the flow. Yeah, I asked Pete what kind of sports he played, and you play the flow sports. It's snowboarding, mm-hmm. it's skateboarding, it's surfing. It's, it's wakeboarding. It's, you're in the flow. You're moving. I like skydiving too. That's a good one. Oh. I, did you jump on the wakeboard? Yeah. Yeah, that's my whole thing. Love it. I did it as a kid. I was always... I only just learned how to wakeboard the what? last few years. Oh, man. I've been... Because I wanted to teach the kids a new sport again, another balanced sport, uh, where they're fully immersed in the moment, and it's not a team sport because they play team sports um, with their schools and yeah. they do dancing in a group. So I was like, hey, let's do these individual sports as well um, just so they can work out yeah. their own journey because I found that worked really well with me. So wakeboarding, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to learn how to do this as a 40-year-old. And you know, I go a couple of times a year. How inspiring is that? Love it. Wakeboarding, uh, snowboarding. Skiing, skating. Skiing, surfing. Skating, surfing skateboarding next one's uh kite surfing and foil boarding but that's next <laughs> i did the um what's a really fun one is like the seat behind the boat i forget what you call it oh, but yeah, like yeah. you're on a seat Hydro and like foil. you pop yeah you pop on the foil that's really fun it took a little while but that was really exciting i if, i live in kailua in hawaii it's a kiteboarding capital if you get out there i'll be there <laughs> uh, i've learned to go one way i haven't learned to come back yet so uh, I'm, I'm i'm on the journey actually australia has good kiteboarding right i think i saw a lot when i was there they have some great ones all right yeah. this is awesome. So awesome i mean we could talk about we've basically been doing like a six hour podcast it seems like <laughs> since uh this morning but we only recorded the last hour um awesome stuff thanks pete you got um got your movie coming out you got your book heel at Chef Pete Evans. Yep. You can just follow us on Instagram. And we've got a free program called The Paleo Way. We've had 100,000 people do it. It's thepaleoway.com. And it's 300 recipes, meal plans, all the information. So, so yeah, use it. I love it. I love it. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you.